What if I told you there was a device where you could play your original Game Boy, Game Boy Color and even Game Boy Advance cartridges, giving you the option to rediscover over three decades worth of Nintendo's best? What if I told you if that wasn't enough, you could also play games of its arch rival, the Sega Game Gear, on the very same device using original cartridges as well? What if I told you that if you wanted even more than that, you could load it up with all kinds of other retro games, all playable on a beautiful modern display that sports a higher pixel density than the Steam Deck and Switch combined? If that screen is not enough though, how about hooking it up to a TV for some local 4-player action? And yes, if that still wouldn't be enough, how about making your own games or dive into some indie game titles? And if you crave even more than that, take a break, relax a little bit with the built-in synthesizer and sequencer, because why not? Well, as you can see, such a magical device does exist, and it is called the Analog Pocket. As is per usual with these videos, I'm going to break it down into smaller chunks, starting with an overview of the hardware, the games, or in this case, the experience of playing them, including other systems such as the Neo Geo. I'll also be taking a look at the dock and giving my impressions on the synthesizer and GB Studio before ending with the conclusion to this hopefully not too tedious video about the little plastic box that unleashes childhood memories and an unhealthy amount of nostalgia. Alright, so this is the Analog Pocket, a retro gaming handheld that was first announced in late 2019 and finally began shipping sometime in 2022. But what is the Analog Pocket exactly and why should you bother? Because as the current state of retro gaming is, pretty much everything plays old video games these days. Heck, even Nintendo just launched their own Game Boy and Game Boy Advance libraries on the Switch, so why bother with another piece of hardware to do just the same? Well, let me give you a single audible response to that. Nice. This doesn't just play old games, it plays your old games, not just a refreshed digital copy or a differently acquired image that you'd load into your device, no, it plays your old games. For example, the last time I played this very copy of Sonic Advance, I was sitting in a school bus on the way to Italy when I was 15. This is my copy of Sonic Advance, and when I first dug this out and booted up the pocket, I was transported back 20 years to discover that my chaos garden was, well, utterly deserted. The crime scene. My crime scene. <clears throat> but what you will also discover is that the games don't look like they used to. The Pocket has an amazing 1600 by 1440 resolution display, which looks absolutely stunning. Apart from looking gorgeous and being backlit, its high resolution display also allows for a few nifty tricks. For example, depending on the platform, you get between two and five display modes, some of which emulate the lower pixel density of older devices by literally turning off pixels in between to create that old school look which works surprisingly well. It's kind of like the scan lines on certain emulation systems like the SNES Classic, except that this isn't a software layer or a filter on top. This separation happens with physical pixels. But as sharp and clean as the display is, it's not always perfect. Depending on the game and platform, the presets can be a little bit overwhelming. In Golden Sun, for example, Analog's default colors look off and I didn't like the super smooth look. Switching to the original GBA LCD made it better, but I still felt like it could be improved, especially considering how amazing the original Game Boy and Game Boy Color games look. The DMG preset for GB games, for example, emulates the green tinted display from the 1989 classic, and it works really well, almost making it feel like the pixels are slightly elevated off the screen, like the original. Color games look beautiful too, and due to the aspect ratio of the display, you also get the most from these two platforms, visually speaking. If the presets aren't enough though, you can further adjust certain attributes depending on the system, such as the sharpness, desaturation, and frame blending. A short disclaimer here, I would hardly call myself a purist on these matters, in fact I'm not experienced with retro games at all, this is the first device of this kind that I own and I know there is a vast selection of alternatives, some of which are way more affordable than others that do a better job of recreating these classics. For example, Nintendo just recently launched their own Game Boy and Game Boy Advance emulation and I gotta tell you, they look pretty damn fantastic, but I'll get to why I still prefer playing on the pocket later. Visuals aren't the only part of the equation though, they would be nothing without the controls and I'm happy to report that unlike with the display where I had to fiddle around a bit in order to get the optimal experience, the D-pad and action buttons felt right at home. 
I was a bit more worried about the shoulder triggers though, but it turned out to be not an issue at all for me. They are very similar to the ones found on the SP, but whereas the SP had the cartridge slot at the bottom, the pocket has it on top, which could block your fingers. I didn't have any issues though, as mine ended up shooting right past the game, but it can be a problem for some. Still, I preferred games where the shoulder buttons weren't heavily used, but full disclosure here, I never liked shoulder buttons on any handheld. Not here, not on the PSP, nowhere. Game controllers, yes. Handhelds, no. But overall, I really liked this form factor, which isn't a surprise as it's very close to the original Game Boy or Pocket in terms of looks, hence the name I suppose. But Pocket it is not. For some reason I never checked the specifications and just assumed that it was the same size as the Game Boy Pocket because it looks so similar, but it's actually quite a bit larger. Now I don't own the original anymore, but I do have this dissected wall piece here that I got as a gift from my pals last year. As you can see the difference is noticeable and putting it next to the SP or even a Micro makes it look even bigger. It is about the same size as the original Game Boy though. Comparing it to the Switch or Steam Deck on the other hand makes it look, well, pocketable again. In fact, I'd argue that one of its biggest strengths is its size, at least when compared to those. If you look at the other rivals such as the Anbernic RG35XX or the GBA Slate SP, which is a modification where you take the original guts from an SP and put it into a shiny new housing, show again that the pocket isn't so pocket after all. It's also quite a bit heavy, heavier than it looks at least, which makes it feel premium if it wasn't for the plastic that Analog used. Now, I'm not an expert in materials, so I can't comment on what composition this exactly is, but if you've held plastic before, which I'm sure you did, you know that there's the kind that feels really solid, and then there's the kind that feels, well, a bit cheap, and unfortunately, this is that kind. Which is a bit disappointing considering the $220 asking price, but let me try to explain what I mean. At the bottom you'll find this single USB-C port, and as much as USB-C has improved our lives for not having to figure out whether or not the cable is the right way up, my deteriorating dexterity still causes me to miss the port every now and then. Or if you own the dock, trying to land correctly isn't always going to work, and in both cases you will end up scratching your device. Now, this isn't unique, you're eventually going to do this on all devices that have physical connections, but the plastic on the pocket wears off really fast, and that's a bit worrying considering this is a handheld and not a stay-at-home console. This thing will be tossed into bags, pockets, and thrown at local banshees. The plastic also has these weird shiny spots around the D-pad and the buttons, as well as other cutout areas. The whole package is just not as confidence-inspiring as its price tag would suggest. If you're worried about the longevity though, you could get the official case, although I think that makes a not so pocketable device even less portable. It looks inconvenient and not something intended for quick storage before tossing it into a bag, but I don't own one, so I could be completely wrong here. Let's finish our hardware tour though. On the sides we also find two speaker grills, which are facing outwards but still get very loud. For Game Boy Advance there is also a high quality audio option, but I wasn't able to tell them apart that well, if at all. On the left we have the volume rockers, which are a bit finicky. Analog chose to go with these tiny little things that I really don't like. The implementation isn't better either, when you change volume all you get is this tiny plus or minus sign on the side until you reach the respective limit, upon which you are greeted with either a max or min. Now apart from being tiny and not giving us any idea of where we are on the volume scale, depending on the game you might not even see what you are doing. The power button fares better, but again, I wish it was more clickable, or actually I wish they would have just copied the slider from the Game Boy. That's about the most responsive and instant way to turn a machine on or off. The button also behaves inconsistently. When you're playing off a cartridge, it'll go to sleep on push and recover nicely just as such. But if you happen to be not in a game, if you are in the menu for example, a single push does nothing. You have to hold it to shut it down completely, which takes a couple of seconds. The same goes for when you want to turn it back on again. Now at first glance this isn't such a big issue, but if you forget about this and think you've turned it off and throw it into a bag, it'll just keep going because the pocket doesn't have an automatic sleep feature either. If you flip the pocket to the other side, we find the micro SD slot that unlocks a ton of features which we'll get into later. On the underside we have the aforementioned USB-C port along with a link port that is of the same type as the original Game Boy, color and advance, so you are able to connect this 2022 device right down to the original 1989 one. I don't have a cable nor an original Game Boy so I wasn't able to test this out, but if it works it's actually quite impressive when you think about it. There's also a headphone jack, but unfortunately no wireless audio. In fact, the pocket doesn't contain any wireless functionality at all. You do get Bluetooth controller support with the dock, but by itself the pocket is about as offline as it gets, which is a pity because, as I mentioned in my Playdate video, as much as I love the idea of old school devices, 
wireless audio is just so convenient. Lastly, and this is really just a tiny nitpick from my side, but the LED at the bottom looks a bit shit. What? I wish the light was more diffused, kind of like the power indicator on a Steam Deck. It would look so much better and match the rest of the minimalistic looks. But it's so transparent that I can literally see into the pocket. It's also really bright, to the point that I found it a bit distracting while playing at night. But all of those nitpicks fade away when you just look at the overall design. It's beautiful and I can imagine that in a sea of retro handhelds and emulation devices, the pocket stands tall and alone is the only, I'm gonna call it, mature looking handheld. I love how the display is slightly protrude and seemingly attached to the front, the minimal lines and just everything. It's a really great looking piece, but how does it play? There's essentially three types of games you can play on a pocket, cartridge, ROMs and GB Studio. The first gives you the arguably best supported experience. You get all of the features, including save states, where you can instantly save a game by hitting the analog button and up, and also load it by doing the same but hitting down instead, giving you a modern advantage to older, tougher games. For example, you could do this just before a boss fight and reload when you die, even if you run out of lives. Every time you add a cartridge, you also get an entry in the library, which is a weird concept that I don't quite get. It basically creates a collection of your games to look at and browse through in a digital format. You can change between a few view modes and if you select a title, you get some metadata like year, region or system. By the way, the little artwork you see here is not something you get by default, you have to add it manually. Normally you get an empty square, but a wonderful person on Reddit has shared a collection of images that works fantastically well. I think it adds a little extra something, even though it's cropped for some reason. If you don't want your games to show up automatically, you can also turn it off and add every game one by one. While in the library, you can also check out and manage all of your save states and screenshots, which you can take at any point in the game by hitting analog and start. Now, this is all fine and dandy, but other than looking at it, you can't really do that much. If you have the cartridge inserted, you can of course start the game, but that's only ever going to be one at a time, so I don't really understand the purpose of this feature. It would be really helpful though when it comes to the ROMs, which is a great segue into the next type of playables. I was actually quite glad that I received my pocket this late, because by the time I got it, the whole ROM situation was sorted out. As far as I heard, it was quite difficult to impossible at the beginning to sideload any games, especially from non-Game Boy and Game Gear systems. But this isn't the case anymore. You can play a vast selection of old titles, including but not limited to NES, SNES, Neo Geo, Atari, and a whole bunch of others, which I never even heard of, including arcade cabinets. This is also a great moment to talk about the FPGA, which is thickly embossed on the front of the pocket and is basically the engine that powers the magic. You see, other systems like the Switch, you play old games using software emulation. On the Pocket, however, it uses hardware emulation. I'm gonna try to explain this as best as I can, but I'm not an expert on this matter, so please bear with me. What an FPGA chip allows you to do is to give it a set of instructions on how it should behave. In our case, this is done by a course. These instructions contain information on how the original chip of a particular system used to work, and the FPGA then reconfigures itself to mimic that old chip, creating a native environment for the games to run, instead of being held in a software layer that does all the translations. But it also means that these cores need to exist, and by default the Pocket only plays games from cartridges, mainly Game Boy, Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance, and Game Gear if you have the adapter. However, loading up the pocket with cores is incredibly easy. I found two applications which I've linked down below that will help you set everything up. In this video, I'll be using Pocket Sync. If you insert an empty microSD card into the pocket, it will immediately populate it with system folders. After that, you need to insert the card into your computer, start up Pocket Sync, and select the respective folder or drive. Once accomplished, you can hit Connect, where you then will be presented with a few options. First, let's go to the aforementioned cores. This is where you can select all the systems you want to install on the pocket. In this example, let's pick Wonderswan, which was a handheld from Bandai that came out in 1999. I remember seeing this on the window shelf at the local game shop. I always wanted one, but it was one of those weird alien systems that I never got. Anyway, just hit install on the top right, confirm it a couple of seconds later, you should be set. Now, there are a few more files needed before this will run, and for that, we have to go to the settings tab. Here you probably should read the disclaimer and decide what to do next, but let's assume that everything is in order and copy the URL displayed there and paste it into the empty field before saving it. Going back to our childhood desire, you can now hit the red part, which opens up a small dialog window to download the remaining files and you're done. Of course, you will need something to play, so let's switch to the games tab and click on Wonderswan. 
This will directly open the folder where you can drop all the necessary files. Now, I can't tell you where to get those. You'll have to figure that out by yourself. But after that, you can push the microSD card back into the pocket and launch OpenFPGA. Here, the pocket will categorize it by system type, such as console or handheld in our case. If you prefer it though, you can change this to list all systems directly in the settings menu. Once selected, you should see the game you transferred. Launch it and behold, the infamous Wonderswan color. If my 13-year-old self would have known that it would take 20 years before I would finally play on this system, he would have probably lost it. But that's how easy it is to get these games running, and it's all thanks to an amazing community of developers who create these cores and applications so that people like me who know nothing can actually play them. So thank you to everyone that made this possible. Thank you. Now, as easy as it is and as wonderful as these games look, OpenFPGA titles aren't quite as fully featured as their cartridge counterparts. For example, display modes, save states, and standby as in being able to shut down the system with a tab while playing are only partially supported. While Analog has said that display modes or the support for it will become available to OpenFPGA cores, save states and standby support is already here, but it is up to the developers who make these cores to implement it. And by the looks of it, it's not an easy thing to do. So save states and standby already work on some systems like Game Boy and Game Gear, as well as NES, but not on systems like SNES and many others. This can be a bit annoying if you have long boot up times like on the Neo Geo, so a, a quick round of Metal Slug might feel a bit sluggish. <laughs> so keep this in mind if your primary use case is during a commute. At home though, the standby issue might not be such a big deal. Which brings us neatly to the dock. The dock is an optional accessory you can get for $99. Quite pricey if all you want is output to your TV, but it does add a few additional features, mainly controller support for up to four wireless or two wired controllers, via the two USB ports on the back, which is a weird placement if you ask me. Then there's the support for the analog DAC, which is their high-end digital to audio video converter, which will allow you to hook up the pocket to a CRT display, which is really cool if you're looking for a pure retro experience. At the time of this video though, it's not yet fully supported and the DAC will run you an extra $79.99. I mainly bought the dock for the big screen experience and was pleasantly surprised at just how well it actually worked. Pairing the controls was super easy too and although the official list of supported ones is rather short, the reality is actually much better. I tried the DualShock 4, which is on the list and connected without any issues, and the DualSense and the Xbox Series controllers worked just as well. I didn't test any wired ones as I don't own any USB pads, but I could imagine that the support there might be better as well. In the end, I was glad that I didn't purchase any retro game pads. It might be blasphemous to play Super Mario with a PlayStation controller, but nobody can see me doing this at home, so it should be fine. Depending on the amount of pads connected, you will also have a small indication on the bottom left of your screen. An offside tip here, if you didn't know, Xbox controllers can be paired with two different systems. If you want to add another one like the analog pocket, just hold the pairing button, wait for the Xbox logo to start blinking, select it on the pocket menu and you're done. If you now want to switch back to the Xbox, just double tap the pairing button and webam, you're back in Microsoft town. Double tap it again and it's pocket time. This is pretty cool and will allow you to boot up the pocket without touching it when it is docked, which is another neat quality of life feature, so it behaves just like modern consoles. I quickly ran some tests just to see if the 4 player support works and to my surprise again, it did without any issues. Depending on the system though, you may have to enable the 4 controller support. For example, on SNES you have to activate the multi-tab, which is, if you didn't know, a peripheral that was launched back in the day to hook up more than 2 controllers. Another cool feature of the dock is how it behaves when you add it while you are playing a game. It's actually just like the Switch, as in it will switch to the TV output with a short delay. The same goes when you unplug it from the dock, meaning you could be playing a game on the couch and just pull it out, take it with you and enjoy the freedom of playing your retro games wherever you are. Really cool. But for when you are docked, the overall experience doesn't change much. All of the features and limitations mentioned before between cartridges, ROMs, systems, all of them are exactly the same. You can still take screenshots using the same shortcuts, save states if those are supported and even change between the display modes. Of course the effect is not as impressive on a TV, but it's still cool to see. I also found myself to prefer the analog preset much more on the big screen than I did on the built-in one. The dock will also output up to 1080p 60Hz, but you can lower it down to 48050. I don't know if these settings are always the same though, maybe this can vary between screens, but these were the ones that I had on my unit. Finally, let's wrap this up with the last two parts, that is the GB Studio and the Nanoloop synthesizer. 
I'm not going to deep dive into either of those two as this would probably kill the scope of this already super long video, but the first is something I never even heard of before, but have fallen in love since. I like all things game design, and even if I'm not capable of actually making any games, I'm just endlessly fascinated and GB Studio is basically a free to use dev kit to create, well, Game Boy games. This isn't something exclusive to Analog or the Pocket either, it has existed before and people have made games. Analog just took it and built it into the Pocket by default. You can find some amazing titles that people have made such as a partial port of Disco Elysium, which I still can't believe exists. and is the exact reason why I love indie developers. Now, if you download titles from itch.co, you'll sometimes get different file types. If it comes in the .pocket format, it's something you'll have to launch in GB Studio. If you get the .gb or gbc files, you can move those straight into the game folder from the Game Boy or Game Boy Color, meaning you can play those games just like any other official game, profiting off features such as save states and standby support. In the Playdate video, I actually tried to make something using the dev kit there, but here I couldn't manage to find the time to play around with it, but from the looks of it, it's probably a lot of fun. The second tool found built into the pocket is Nanoloop. This, like GB Studio, is something that has existed before. I even own a physical cartridge, although it isn't actually mine. I never used it, and in a nutshell, this is quite a capable synthesizer and sequencer. Another quirky note here, if you play off the cartridge version, you get all the usual display modes. The internal version, however, is a lot newer, but is entirely in black and white. But anyway, I didn't spend too much time in here either, but if you are interested in the Pocket's more musical abilities, might I recommend you the channel from VVLV Music. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, but you'll find great tutorials there, and you can also check out some of the cool tunes, which are pretty impressive. There are more features that I didn't touch on, like detailed controller customizations, extra features that come with certain cores, and well, a whole lot more in general, but I think I'll leave that out for another day if you're interested. For now, let's bring this one home. When I originally bought the Pocket, my curiosity was mostly caused by its physical appearance, with the prospect of playing my old games coming in at a close second. But they quickly changed place after I saw my old save states and once again began enjoying them on the go. It is something that I didn't anticipate, at least not to this degree, but very much appreciate. But then it got even better. All the other systems the Pocket is capable of recreating opened up a whole new world that was previously unknown to me or long forgotten. Now, I never played much if any other retro systems before. I know there are much cheaper, more portable or more faithful systems even, like the Mister, And there are even big ones like the Steam Deck, which can play just about anything and go far beyond what the Pocket is capable of. Dreamcast, PlayStation, Nintendo 64, you name it. But there's something about the form factor of the Pocket that just feels right for these types of 2D games. Even compared to the Switch, which has just recently launched its own GB and GBA catalog. However, I can't believe that Nintendo is asking us to pay a yearly subscription just to play them. Once again proving that they are the masters of letting us pay multiple times for the exact same games. Those do look fantastic though, even questioning the analog's accuracy in reproducing the original colors. But again, the bigger display isn't always better, it just feels more right to play Game Boy, Game Gear or consoles like the Neo Geo in this form factor. On this screen, it just feels better. Which is a pity, because the issues I have with the Pocket really taint the otherwise amazing experience. I can get over the smaller hardware nitpicks. Yes, the power and volume buttons could be vastly improved, and I wonder how portable I will find this in the summer when I won't have a jacket to carry it around with me at all times. Then there are the weird software inconsistencies. Everything seems a bit off, a bit more inconvenient than it has to be. The whole system just doesn't feel that intuitive. The library, for example, doesn't help me with anything. If I could add my ROMs though, I could use it as a favorites list, which would make it much faster to get to the games I actually want to play, instead of going through countless menus and systems. Yes, I could just limit the amount of titles I carry, but who doesn't want to have the option of everything, everywhere, all at once? The cartridge experience isn't perfect either. When it works, it's amazing and as previously mentioned, will give you more features than the ROMs, at least for now. But they don't always work that well or at all. I even had instances where previously reliable games just suddenly stopped working. And it's definitely not the cartridge because the affected ones seem to run just fine on the original hardware. Which ironically makes playing ROMs more convenient and reliable. Adding insult to injury, the ROM support isn't even in Analog's hands, it's the result of all the amazing people who took the time and effort to create the cores. 
Now this is something that Analog had planned from the get-go. The Pocket actually has two FPGA chips, with the second one being dedicated for third-party cores, but it doesn't really end here. The whole library shtick, if you want, is also entirely dependent on other people. Without them, there wouldn't be any images, and it would look a bit shit. What? In retrospect, I felt a bit weird about the premium price tag, because Analog relies on others in order to achieve their vision. The one thing they do have, though, is the screen. No other retro handheld, at least to my knowledge, has such a unique looking display. And I have to admit, for me it mostly comes down to this as to why I would choose it over the others. It's again not perfect. The form factor and resolution are very much Game Boy first, which I find ironic because Analog keeps talking about video game history preservation, but I feel like the pocket is so Game Boy specific that it just seems like an odd thing to say. In the end, I found everything to be a little half-baked. It's wonderful when it works, but more often than not, it either doesn't or feels incomplete, which is a real pity because it would otherwise be such an amazing piece of hardware. There were moments of absolute brilliance that made me feel like I was playing a Nintendo Switch from the late 80s. It was amazing and I loved it for it, but just a second later it throws you a weird curveball and the whole illusion breaks. But even with those issues, I would still buy it again, because when the games do work, they play absolutely fantastic and they look beautiful. You could say that, at the core, the analog pocket is perfect. It's just everything around it that could use some work. Hey, thank you so much for watching my video and I hope I got all the things right. If not, as usual, please let me know because I clearly don't. You know, at the beginning I was hoping this was going to be a short one. I was not anticipating an edit this long. Well, anyway, thank you again and I hope you're well. Be safe and see you in the next one. Bye.